Good evening. Welcome to Digging Deeper, What's Behind the Headlines in Dementia Research. My name is Erin Crawford. I'm the Program Director here at the Alzheimer's Society of Manitoba, and I will be your MC for this online event tonight. Tonight, Dr. Donald Weaver is going to help us discover the science and the reality behind some of the eye-catching headlines that we all see, but don't know what to believe. Before I get started, though, it is important for us to stop and take a moment to acknowledge the First Peoples on whose traditional territories we live and work. The Alzheimer's Society of Manitoba's head office is located on Treaty 1 territory, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect both the land and the people on this land, and all Indigenous people who have walked in this place, and we respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of collaboration. Today is World Alzheimer's Day, an opportunity for us to talk about dementia, show our support for families who are living with the disease, and create awareness, the resources that exist here at the Alzheimer's Society, and awareness of what some of the challenges are faced by those families. Today I'm wearing blue in support of families living on an Alzheimer's journey, and I know many of you are as well. Worldwide, an astounding 50 million people are diagnosed with dementia, and 23,000 of those live just here in Manitoba alone. Having a globally coordinated World Alzheimer's Month sends a strong message to governments and policymakers that dementia is a serious health issue that is in danger of overwhelming our systems if we don't pay attention to it as our population ages. Um, and we just finished an election here yesterday and hopefully that was a message that some of our elected officials heard and we will see changes in the support for people with dementia. Now, I would like to take a moment to thank Brightwater Winnipeg for their generous support as the event sponsor of tonight's research forum. With the financial support that they've provided, we've been able to offer this event tonight free of charge. Here's Kim Knott, the Executive Director of Brightwater Senior Living of Tuxedo with a few words. Hello everyone, I'm Kim Knott, the Executive Director of Brightwater Senior Living of Tuxedo. We value our close relationship with the Alzheimer's Society of Manitoba and are especially excited this year to sponsor the research forum. I am a registered nurse that have been practicing in long-term care for over 25 years. I know firsthand the importance of the education and support for those living with Alzheimer's and dementia. At Brightwater Senior Living of Tuxedo, we offer independent, assisted, and memory care options. Each and every day, we care for those living with Alzheimer's and dementia, and we cannot be more grateful for the education, support, and partnership that the Alzheimer's Society offers us and the community as a whole. Thanks, Kim, and thanks again to Brightwater Winnipeg. Now, let's talk research. This is why we're here. We at the Alzheimer's Society are pleased to support the 2021 grants and awards for the Alzheimer's Society Research Program, funding Canadian researchers in the field of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, and investing in the future of dementia care in Canada. We also fund a graduate student fellowship program here in Manitoba. One of last year's recipients is here with us tonight, Courtney Addison is a second year master's student in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Recreation Management. Her research project, Music and Movement, her research focuses on how music and movement can help people with dementia. She is currently looking for research participants, so if you'd be interested in participating in her study, please contact the Alzheimer's Society, and I will turn this over to Courtney. Thank you, Erin, for that amazing introduction. And thank you to the Alzheimer's Society of Manitoba for providing support to local researchers like me and helping advance dementia research in our province. Okay, now I would like to introduce the person you've been waiting for, the world-renowned and award-winning scientist, Dr. Donald Weaver from the, from the Crimble Research Institute, who will take you through some dementia research findings to discover more about the science behind news headlines. Dr. Donald Weaver is an internationally recognized researcher in drug design for neurological disorders. He is unique being a practicing neurologist with a PhD in medicinal chemistry. 
He has published in all aspects of brain-related drug discovery in journals such as Nature Medicine, the New England Journal of Medicine, and Neurology. He has designed two drugs that have reached phase three human trials and has four others in preclinical development. One of these drugs, tramiprosate, was one of the first disease-modifying drugs to reach phase three trials for Alzheimer's dementia. Dr. Weaver has published numerous peer-reviewed papers and a popular medicinal chemistry textbook. He holds 27 issued patents with 62 patents pending. He has won numerous national and international research awards. Dr. Weaver has been the Kremble Research Institute Director since 2013. I'll now turn it back to Erin so we can get started. Thanks, Courtney, and welcome to the Alzheimer's Society Research Forum, Dr. Weaver. Hello, glad to be here. Thank you very much for being here. We're glad to have you. So let's look at some headlines. You got to make the questions easy, right? <laughs> We're going to look at headlines and see what you can tell us about what's really behind this. What should the people here tonight <clears throat> really take away from some of these stories that they might have seen over the past year or so? So the first one is topic we're all pretty familiar with in some regards, COVID and dementia. We might be familiar with COVID, but not so much with the fact that it's got a connection to dementia. Dr. Weaver, is there a connection here? What do we think it is? What can you tell us about this? The <clears throat> Yeah, you didn't start with an easy question, did you? Um, so um, certainly the role of COVID-19 uh, and the brain uh, is a uh, much discussed and much disputed uh, area. And let's be honest, we've only been in the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic uh, for you know coming up on two years. Um, and um, so the, the full expanse of it uh, has yet to completely unfold. However, um, I think it is fair to say that COVID uh, is a virus that can affect the brain. It's what we call a neurotropic virus. So it's a virus that can uh, get into brain and can affect brain. Um, individuals who have uh, severe uh, COVID-19 infections who end up in intensive care units frequently will have what we call an encephalopathy, meaning um, that their brain is affected. They may be delirious. Uh, they may have other areas uh, of neurologic problems because uh, of the severity of their COVID-19 infection. Um, so, um, and also the, the propensity uh, of COVID to give long-term effects, uh, I think is recognized because of this entity called long COVID. Uh, so I think that, you know, we're, re we're recognizing that um, it, it's not the cold. It's, it's a lot more than that. Um, this, this is a nasty virus. This is a nasty virus that can get into a lot of areas. A and, you know, initially we focused on, on lungs and everyone thought it was primarily a lung related breathing thing. Oh, it's bigger than that. And it's nastier than that. It, it gets into brain. Uh, and um, I mean, certainly, you know, we're seeing people have seizures, people have delirium people have strokes, that there's a wide range of neurologic uh, uh, and brain complications associated with COVID. Um, and so uh, part and parcel of this has been, um, can COVID uh, have a long lasting effect that sets the person up for eventually having uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease as a long-term consequence of COVID? That is an area that is being discussed um, and um, uh, and I, I must admit that uh, I'm, I'm pleased that just today I had a paper accepted in a journal uh, and the title of it is the nth wave of COVID, will it be <laughs> Alzheimer's? Um, because we're talking about, you know, the second wave, the third wave, the fourth wave, and who many more ways we have. But if we look 20 years down the road, it's the COVID that we've just said now, is it going to be rearing its ugly head again uh, and predisposing people to, to get Alzheimer's? Um, we don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, is it a possibility? Yes, it's a possibility. Can I say definitively one way or the other? No, uh, because we just don't have the information, but is this a, a possible thing that's percolating in background? Yep. Uh, and so uh, with that, I will say 
get your vaccination. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, please, please, please get vaccinated. The, uh, uh, this is not a, a virus you want to fool around with. And so uh, can I say one way or the other? No. Is it a possibility? Yes. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting point. I mean, it is so early on that we don't really have the ability at this point to tell some of those long-term effects. No. But and, you know, what we're going to find out. We are going to find out. to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and interesting for organizations like ours to have information about that so that when we are talking to people down the road who are concerned, as we do, concerned that they are seeing symptoms of dementia or signs of dementia, yeah. that that starts to become part of the questions that we ask, yes. uh, you know, what, did you have COVID-19 at some point? And did that's a fair question to ask. And I mean, we can't give them a definitive answer, but we have to say that Many people have brought this up and it's a point of worry and a point of concern. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. Dawn. Dawn. Dr. Dawn? <laughs> <laughs> Just Dawn. Dawn. All right. Well, thank you, Dawn. So before we go to our next news item, we have a poll that I hope can come up for our audience to answer. If you had the chance through a blood test, would you want to know your risk of developing dementia? So I'm gonna give people a few minutes, well, not a few minutes, a few seconds here to fill this out. Our early responders were all yes, and now the no's are taking it up a little bit. It's like watching the election results come in. It is like watching the election results. All right, so I think we've closed the poll with 85% of people saying, yes, they would take a blood test if there was one available for them. Well, our next news item is a CBS clip titled, New Blood Test for Alzheimer's, a Huge Breakthrough for millions of patients and families. We'll just take a look at that. But now a simple blood test may take the guesswork out. A new study published in JAMA found the test could determine whether people with dementia had Alzheimer's instead of another condition with up to 98% accuracy. And it also identified signs of the disease 20 years before memory problems were expected in people with the genetic mutation that causes Alzheimer's. We need treatments and cures and ways to prevent Alzheimer's disease, but you can't treat a disease unless you can diagnose it. The test detects and measures certain proteins associated with the disease. But even with promising results, local experts warn more validation is needed and the test isn't ready for widespread use yet. So, interesting dilemma here. I guess, what are your thoughts on this and how important, I get there's, there's a lot of threads to this one. Um, how important is an early test and what kinds of benefits and challenges does it present to families, to individuals, to doctors? Um, to me, the take home message of that clip was the last statement that um, it needs to be better validated uh, and uh, it may not be quite ready for prime time uh, just, uh, just yet. Um, is this a huge step forward? Yes. The, um, you know, if you look at the World Health Organization's recognition of the top 10 diseases in the world, uh, Alzheimer's has had the dubious distinction of being the only one uh, for which we have no definitive diagnostics and no definitive therapeutics. Um, the other issue, of course, um, is that uh, if you're going to treat people, you sort of have to know if they have it. Um, uh, because certainly uh, all Alzheimer's is dementia, but not all dementia is Alzheimer's. Uh, and also, you know, being um, honest here, uh, who knows if really if Alzheimer's is one disease or multiple diseases, and we're just not good enough yet to distinguish between them. Uh, so 
um, you know, just as it's important that we work on developing therapeutics, it's equally important that we advance the whole area uh, of diagnostics, of figuring out, you know, if people have Alzheimer's or not. Now, the blood tests that are being developed look for uh, minute levels of a protein uh, called amyloid, uh, beta amyloid in the blood. And this is a, a protein um, and it's made up of little building blocks called amino acids. And there's some that have 40 uh, building blocks and some that have 42. And it looks at both of these and it looks at the ratio between them. Um, and yes, there is undoubtedly a, a correlation. Uh, if you have dementia and you have uh, a high blood level of these, the likelihood that you have Alzheimer's is, is very high. Uh, also, um, as was mentioned quite correctly, um, years beforehand, because let's face it, the, the dementia process has started decades before the first, before the person presents himself to their family physician or whoever, you know, with um, uh, issues uh, of problems with memory and cognition. Um, and so knowing that the person has an elevated level may be of some benefit. But once again, this is an area where we haven't had people who had a high level uh, of amyloid in their blood and followed them for 20 years to see if it really did predict. Um, you know, so it, it's a little wishful thinking to say, oh, this will predict it in 20 years. You don't really know until you've done the study. Uh, but um, um, certainly one cannot deny that uh, an elevated uh, amount of beta amyloid in your blood would certainly probably suggest that um, you uh, are at risk for developing uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, you know, ultimately I know where we're going to, in tonight, we're also going to get to aducanumab. We, we can't avoid that one. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think that tests like this are important in finding out people who might respond to that drug, because uh, that's a very amyloid focused drug. So, you know, if, if you have a, an elevated amyloid level, then maybe a drug that targets amyloid might be good for you. Uh, so uh, overall, I think that, yes, this is a significant step forward. Um, however, uh, this is an area where, where people are, are, are thirsty for information and, you know, things are getting put out there. But I think that we have to be kept aware uh, of the limitations of this, that uh, it needs further validation, et cetera. Um, but um, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very worthwhile uh, test. And I think that ultimately this is a test that will be incorporated into hopefully a battery of tests that people who have dementia and possible Alzheimer's disease receive as we try to figure out what type they have and what is the best therapy for them as an individual. I guess it's probably one of the things about dementia research and, and research in general that is probably very frustrating for people who have a dementia diagnosis now, which is that it's a long game. And so once you have an effective treatment, it's great to have an effective test to diagnose it. Yep. If you don't have an effective treatment, um, it feels less meaningful, but, but you've got to ultimately get get both. Yes, ultimately both. And, and as some of the people in the chat have been mentioning, you know, this is, this is worthwhile for uh, necessarily putting your affairs into order uh, and just appreciating what it is that you have. Information um, is valuable. Yeah. Cause there's an ethical, an ethical, ethical, or just a question for how you want to live your own life and the information exactly. that you need yep. in order to be prepared and do the planning that is important. Even when the treatment research maybe hasn't gone as far along the road as some of the diagnostic research or as far as you know, it's, it's lagging. Yeah. Might yeah. Like. yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. The next item that we are going to look at relates to heart health. This from the daily mail maintaining a healthy heart and reducing arterial stiffening may help to prevent dementia in later life study finds. And maybe before we get into this, I'll just mention, I know people are putting things into the chat there and we're moving through the topics, but we will come back to those uh, chat questions after we've gone through all of them. So you won't lose your chance to ask those questions. 
So just to, to repeat this one, maintaining a healthy heart and reducing arterial stiffening may help to prevent dementia in later life study finds. So, you know, not, not news that we should be paying attention to our hearts, um, not news that arterial stiffening is a problem, but the connection to dementia. Can you tell everyone tonight a bit more about what we know about that, what we don't, what we should be doing, what, what we shouldn't? Okay, um, so the, um, <clears throat> and heart health and vascular health is important, most definitely. Um, so a, a, a statement that I made just a little bit earlier was that all the Alzheimer's is, uh, is dementia, but not all dementia is Alzheimer's. There is another subtype of dementia called vascular dementia. Um, your brain loves blood. Every time your heart beats, 25% of the blood that your heart squirts out goes to your brain. A quarter, a quarter of the blood uh, that your heart puts out goes to your brain. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you look, that ain't worth a quarter of your body. I mean, my, my head is not, does not constitute one quarter of my body mass, but it's got one quarter of the blood. Um, and so you, your brain, uh, when it's working well, uh, has a voracious appetite for blood. Um, and in fact, if we were to take a 100 gram cube of brain, uh, that wants 50, 50, 50 milliliters of blood per minute to keep it happy. And if we start dropping that down a little bit, uh, then the brain doesn't work so well and memory starts to give problems. Uh, and uh, so if we have arteries that aren't working quite so well, uh, they have hardening of the arteries, we have um, uh, you know, issues uh, related to, to blood supply, then this person may be being set up for, for vascular dementia. Next, um, the, there is an issue uh, of that Alzheimer's disease is not necessarily purely Alzheimer's disease. There are lots of individuals who have hybrids who have a significant vascular problem and Alzheimer's. And so they really are a mixture of, of Alzheimer's type dementia and vascular dementia working together. And in fact, vascular problems related to clogged up blood vessels is a risk factor for Alzheimer's. Um, and then the third thing that I will mention in this is the other culprit in this, which is cholesterol. Um, and um, certainly high cholesterol levels predisposed to heart disease and to stroke and to vascular disease, but also elevated cholesterol levels are a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So, um, and um, the way that um, um, I look at this is, is as follows. Um, we've been talking about this protein called beta amyloid, uh, and it has historically been, been the culprit the, the bad guy uh, in, in, the, uh, in the story of, of Alzheimer's disease. And when beta amyloid clumps up, when it's, we call it aggregation, but when it clumps up, it literally functions as a battering ram and it kills neurons. Um, if those neurons have a lot of cholesterol in them, they get killed more easily by the beta amyloid. So um, just to recap then, uh, Yes, there is a relationship uh, and that heart disease and vascular disease predisposes people to um, vascular dementia, that there is an overlap between vascular dementia and Alzheimer's with vascular problems being a risk factor. And finally, cholesterol, uh, which is an independent risk factor for heart disease is also an independent risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So these two, they go together uh, and uh, heart health is brain health. The, um, uh, and uh, being a neurologist, I, you know, I, I regard the heart as, um, um, you know, as a simple pump with, with cardiologists being overpaid pump mechanics, but uh, the, uh, oops, uh, the, um, uh, <laughs> nevertheless, um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, one has to take care of their heart health in order to have brain health. But yeah, the brain is the defining organ, which makes you, you, and the heart's merely a pump that provides blood to the brain. <laughs> Well, maybe I'm going to ask you a follow-up question that maybe you've hinted at what the answer will be. I was going to ask what the relationship is between clinicians or researchers who are working on brain health and heart health. And 
<laughs> I'm it's sensing much better it's than I implied. Okay, it's much better than I implied. <laughs> 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 I, I was. I was just being a little difficult there. Um, but if the average person goes in to see to see their doctor, would their doctor be like, do you figure they'd likely be aware? Is it pretty well known that there's the connection there? No, I don't think that's, I don't think that's well known. Uh, I don't think that's as fully appreciated as it should be. Um, and, and being quite uh, candid in speaking to many of my cardiology colleagues, they really don't think of brain disease uh, and the consequences, the, the brain consequences of, of cardiac problems. Um, and, and vice versa, I think that a lot of neurologists have their blinkers on and just you know, brain, 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 brain. Um, and, and you really do have to look at the whole patient because uh, they're, you know, the, as, as that article uh, quite rightly points out, uh, heart health is intimately connected to brain health. So maybe for, for people who are attending here tonight, something for them to be aware of when they're having those conversations, maybe their doctor is checking their cholesterol routinely, but yes. maybe they want to engage in that conversation with their I doctor. I mean, I think that, you know, you need a uh, tight control uh, of your, uh, of your blood pressure, tight control of your cholesterol uh, and, and with this, um, diabetes, um, uh, diabetes is, uh, is an area in which cognitive uh, complications frequently occur. Um, and, uh, you know, most people don't think of that, but I mean, in, in diabetes, there's lots of vascular complications um, uh, and uh, the diabetes is a risk factor uh, for Alzheimer's because it's a vascular risk factor. Um, and so, you know, keeping all those things under control, watching them all and keeping them tightly regulated is ultimately important for your brain. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I think that's helpful. Before we move on to our next headline, we're going to do another poll. And you're right, Dr. Weaver, we are going to be talking about aducanumab and that's coming up next. So before we get to that, this poll question, it seems unrelated, but we're going to tie it back together. What's your go-to source of dementia research related news? We'll give people a few seconds to fill out the poll. So your options being newspaper, TV, radio, internet slash web, or social media, Facebook and Twitter. Nobody wants to admit the social media one, but come on. <laughs> Just leave it for another few seconds. I had someone say to me today, does anybody under the age of 50 use Facebook? Um, no, I, <laughs> yes, my kids routinely tell me news that they get from TikTok. And I probably shouldn't put it in air quotes because they probably do learn some things there. Uh, and it makes me seem old to put it in air quotes. All right, let's see. So. 31% of people from the newspaper, 22% TV, 13% radio, 80% internet, web, 3% social media. So the vast majority of people here anyways, probably representative of, of a wider population, but certainly here, the vast majority are getting their news from the internet. So our next story is on aducanumab, and we're going to uh, see a headline here. Canadian calls U.S. approval of Alzheimer's drug a light at the end of the tunnel, but scientists are skeptical, according to CBC. So one of the reasons we put that poll there, and we want to talk about aducanumab writ large. Um, I think that's probably something that people, a lot of people here are quite interested to uh, hear your points on and to probably offer some comments themselves. But part of what has happened with the aducanumab story, it seems, is that uh, different sources told very different stories about aducanumab, its potential, its promise, versus some of the controversy that surrounded its approval. Um, and I think that that quite possibly people's impression of it will vary quite a bit depending on how they came to hear about it in the first place. So I guess in addition to talking about aducanumab proper, I'd also be interested in your thoughts on 
why it's so controversial. Who do we believe? Because some people seem to think that this is going to come and, and, and really radically alter dementia treatment. And other people seem to be suggesting that there's no evidence whatsoever and it should never have been approved. And so um, we laugh about that a little bit in some ways, but at the same time, as somebody who's desperately hoping for a breakthrough, how frustrating to have those two different um, stories being told and be stuck in the position of trying to determine which would be correct. Okay. Um, one of the editorials in a neurology journal said that neurologists' response to the approval of aducanumab ranged from this is an opportunity to this is appalling. Um, on that spectrum, I'm not at either end, but I'm more towards the skeptical end. Um, and, and, and certainly the day that aducanumab was approved, um, I must say that I probably had 15 emails before I even knew it when people go, you got to be kidding me. They actually approved this. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I knew that it was up in front of an, of an FDA panel and I had basically made the assumption it was going to get rejected. I, I mean, and I was like, whoa, they, they approved it? That didn't, didn't see that one coming. Um, the, um, uh, so, I mean, really, aducanumab is an interesting agent. Um, first of all, it is a biologic. Uh, so when we talk about therapeutics, um, we talk uh, about, you know, things that are pills. So if you use an aspirin or, or something like that, that's what we call a small molecule pill. Um, uh, whereas uh, aducanumab, that, that's a great big molecule. So it's a great big molecule that has to be given uh, intravenously, a completely different sort of, uh, uh, of thing. Um, and the biologics are widely being used uh, quite successfully in the treatment of like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis or things of that sort. And so biologics have a, have a huge um, and very successful role to play in a wide range of, of diseases. Um, but my, my first issue here is that it's a great big molecule. Getting this into the brain is like trying to drive a bus, you know, through a keyhole. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's, it's a little tough and way under one, per, way under 1% of this drug actually gets into your brain. Uh, so that's the, the first point that I will, I will make here. Um, the um, uh, next, a drug has a risk benefit ratio. Um, what's the risks and what are the benefits? For usually for a drug that we want to get approved, the benefits should outweigh the risks. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you look at aducanumab, the likelihood of it producing a beneficial response is probably under 10%. The likelihood of it giving you side effects is 30 to 40%. And some of those side effects are not minor, uh, you know, and, um, brain swelling and uh, issues such as that uh, have been documented and have been seen. Um, the other issue is, is that um, aducanumab probably works if you take it when you're 20 years old and 20 years before you get the first signs of Alzheimer's. Um, the, um, uh, so in, in the natural history of Alzheimer's, there's a whole bunch of events that happen. And one of the first things that happens uh, is this clumping up uh, of, of amyloid, this, this aggregation that I was talking about. But this is something that happens years, years before your first sign. Um, and so if you wait until the person presents with memory problems and cognition problems, the ship has sailed. This aducanumab is not going to work in those people. You gotta get them early, early. Uh, and so, I mean, we talk about MCI, mild cognitive impairment, uh, which is, you know, the, the predecessor. Um, and um, so the earlier one takes this medication, the problem, you know, it probably works if you take it really, really early, which gets back to the earlier question about the blood test that I said, ah, we're gonna get the aducanumab. Um, you know, if, um, 
uh, if I were um, uh, 30 years old and I'm, you know, maybe a few years beyond that. Uh, and uh, no, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, the, um, uh, and, you know, I had a, 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 a whack and high blood level of, 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 of amyloid. I might be going, yeah, yeah, and you can, Matt, that's, that's the drug for me, if only I could afford it. Uh, and, um, um, you know, so I think that for its, uh, its rollout, it, this is problematic. The, the um, uh, I mean, the FDA announced its, its uh, approval through this special program, but then, you know, not long afterwards, they said they changed that and said for very mild cases. And if, and if you look at the, at the, the various Alzheimer's groups in uh, clinics in the United States, they're basically putting together their own protocols to figure out how they're going to use this. I think it's sad uh, that they're putting together their own protocols and that, um, you know, the regulations haven't done it uh, a better job uh, from that perspective. Um, and so there are groups that said, well, everyone should have tau levels measured, which is the other protein that, that clogs up in, in there. Because if you've already got tau levels going up, you're too late in the process and stuff like this. So we don't even know how to use the drug correctly yet. Um, okay, I was going to say, when, tell me what you mean when you say we don't, that people are making up their own protocols. Yeah. So, I mean, like, so if, um, uh, if a person comes to you and says, um, you know, as a physician, and I'm looking at this from an American point of view, because we don't have it up here. Um, um, you know, someone says, well, I, I got some memory problems. Can, can I have aducanumab? Um, and, um, uh, you know, and you're looking going, well, it's got a lot of side effects. So I want to make sure I'm using it in the right person. And so I want to make sure that it's a person who's early enough in the course of the disease that it might work because if they're too late in the course of the disease, it's not going to work. All I'm doing is exposing them to side effects. Um, and so certainly uh, with Alzheimer's disease, initially this one protein called amyloid clumps up and it clumps up for about 20 years. And then a second protein starts to clump up. It's called tau. Um, but the, there are many groups who would argue that if we're already starting to see tau clumping up, we're too late in the game and aducanumab is not going to work. Um, the, the, uh, and the other issue here, of course, is the price. Um, uh, a year of aducanumab is 56,000 US in the United States. And that doesn't include uh, the MRI scans and the other things that have to be done. Uh, in order to make sure that the person is not getting the side effects, the brain swelling, et cetera. Um, and, um, um, you know, in, in a healthcare system like we have in, in Canada, uh, you can't say, well, everyone's got memory problems, they're going to get aducanumab. I mean, we will drive our system into bankruptcy in a heartbeat uh, with, uh, with that sort of approach. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're going to uh, need much better guidelines on the patients in whom it should be used. So um, I think that it is a significant step forward. Um, it is light at the end of the tunnel, but that's a tunnel that's pretty long. Um, and, um, you know, I think that we need a, a few more years of experience with it to find out just who seems to be the, the best group to use it in uh, before, you know, we actually start uh, thinking about using it. Um, Another uh, issue that, that, that is a personal bother that, that I like to complain about um, is um, Alzheimer's is a global disease. Uh, it's, uh, it's everywhere. Uh, and you, you started off by pointing out that, uh, you know, there are 23,000 people in Manitoba living uh, with, with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And, but how many people around the world are getting it? Uh, well, yeah, it's, uh, it's in every country in the world, regardless of socioeconomic status. Um, this is not a global drug. I mean, global diseases deserve global solutions. This is not a global solution. This is a rich person solution or a rich country solution. Um, and this just magnifies economic disparities and, and difficulties. I would much sooner that someone finds the cheap drug uh, you know, that can be used because uh, uh, biologics aren't cheap. Um, they have to be given, I mean, aducanumab has to be given intravenously uh, once a month. That's, that's not like going to your pharmacy and getting, a, you know, a bottle of pills that you take. Uh, this requires infusion facilities. Uh, it, it is a major economic commitment to the use of this drug. 
Does the enthusiasm over it speak to the lack of options out there? Of course. Yes. I mean, you go, um, you know, if you look at uh, the 200 uh, drug trials that, that try to uh, modify uh, the course of Alzheimer's disease beforehand, they all failed. Um, and so, you know, you go, wow, this one actually shows some, some activity. This, this is good. Um, one of the other, I think, important measures from this is um, the cost of developing drugs is prohibitive. The cost of developing drugs for Alzheimer's is even more prohibitive. Um, so, Why is that? Um, you know, if, if uh, you know, let's go back to a cardiac drug. If I'm developing a drug for high blood pressure, say, um, well, you know, you measure my blood pressure. You give me the drug and a couple of weeks later, you measure it and go, yeah, his blood pressure went down. You, you're not going to get a response in two weeks or three weeks with an Alzheimer's drug. You got to follow these people for years. Um, and so that that's expensive. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, if you're talking about, um, you know, a, a clinical trial, if you cut every corner and do it on the cheap as much as you can, a clinical trial for Alzheimer's is going to cost between 600 and 800 million. Um, the last time I checked, CIHR doesn't fund that. Um, and the Institute um, of Health um, Research, right? Um, you know, like, like, do we have a government that's willing to waste 610 million? Oh, sorry, that's a silly question. Um, the um, <laughs> the cost of the election. <laughs> that I deliberately picked that number. Um, <laughs> but the um, um, so and and you know. The, the basic science behind coming up with cures for Alzheimer's and stuff may come from universities, but it's not a university who's going to take it over the goal line. Ultimately, it's going to be a company um, because they're the only ones with the pockets deep enough to, to take this financial risk and to run it in multiple countries. Um, and one of the, the big stumbling blocks that, that we have had in developing drugs for Alzheimer's disease um, is that the... Um, the pharmaceutical companies have run away from it. It's, it's, it's you know, the, the failure rates are high, uh, you know, and, and the risk of failure is just high. And if you have to go and talk to your board of directors and, and to your, you know, your stockholders and say, yeah, let's, let's, you know, throw the dice on Alzheimer's, they're going to go, well, you know, you just wasted almost a billion dollars for something that has a high probability of failing. Why are we doing this? And the fact that aducanumab got approved and Biogen bless the company because it's still a company that's in there up to its armpits and trying to come up with drugs for Alzheimer's um, demonstrated that perhaps that you can make money, uh, which is what the drug companies are in it for, of course. Um, and so uh, hopefully what this does is, is that it brings more investors, more drug companies and more people back into it. Um, and so that, um, you know, this interest will spur additional clinical trials and get the ball rolling again in, in Alzheimer's, which is an area which has been suffering because just the fear of failure is high. Hmm. I think that is an important point because we don't want to leave people um, feeling so discouraged, but it is oh, no. that place where you need to have a vibrant research community, yes. research community, and research begets research. That's right. get developments. And if we keep it going we will ultimately see something. That's right. I mean, to me, this, this is, this is what, and this is why I said I'm not at the, the poles of, of the, that spectrum. Uh, from the point of view of this being a good news story, this is a good news story. This is an agent which probably works if it's given early enough. We just don't have the ability to recognize the patients that are early enough, but this is an agent which probably works. Yeah. Um, and, and we haven't had that before. Yeah. Um, uh, it's just that, you know, by the time that people recognize that they have uh, symptoms, they're probably too late for this particular agent. Um, and um, uh, so, uh, but, you know, wow, this is opening the door for additional research. This is bringing people into the field. This, that is a good feature of this, a very good feature of this. Yeah. And over the, you know, the different subjects we've talked about tonight, and I know we still have another one, there's pieces of puzzles and they're all sort of, it's like when you've got all the corner pieces of the puzzle and you can't see any of it yet and they're not very helpful on their own. And then all of a sudden you get a couple of pieces in there and they make those parts make sense and they make them have a role. 
And so even if on their own, these, these research developments aren't as useful as we'd like them to be, if it continues, we will get there. Yes. Yes. There, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Light, light um, the and, tunnel. um, uh, the, um, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, I'd like to think that everyone on this call is in some way an advocate for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, and I think we should be lobbying our, our members of parliament. Uh, we should be out, you know, saying um, that number one, there's a huge need here. Um, and I, I don't think they appreciate the socioeconomic impact uh, that Alzheimer's disease is gonna have in the long term. Uh, and I think we need to drive that home. And I think we also ha have to drive home the, the second message is, it's not as bleak as you think. Um, there is hope. Uh, the, the field is entirely different from what it was 20 years ago. We're, we're oceans ahead of where we were 20 years ago. We're going in the right direction. And if we make the commitment to Alzheimer's disease that we made for COVID, for example, that we made for um, uh, HIV AIDS, I mean, and look at, I mean, you know, we got a, a whack of drugs for AIDS in a fairly reasonable period of time. We've got vaccines for COVID, but the, the, they harnessed so much scientific power for doing this. If they could do this for Alzheimer's, damn it, we'd be a hell of a lot further ahead than we are. Indeed. And I think I'll say just for, for everybody's benefit here, um, increased government funding for Alzheimer's research was one of the key priorities that the Alzheimer's Society did advance during this past election. And I think it is something, you're absolutely right, if everybody here is an advocate for dementia research, um, then there is a call to action for people to demand that there be increased funding so that we can see some of these developments. All right, we have one final item we want to move on to. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, we will come back to a Q&A. Um, some of the questions that you're putting in the chat, we will come back to. So this doesn't have to be the end of the conversation. So continue to put those in there and we will get to those next. So the final one is a connection between dementia and domestic violence. So let's watch, there is a CTV clip here that we're gonna see. Now medical experts are raising familiar. alarms about another group, victims of domestic assault. It's been a long suspicion of Dawn Weaver that battered women are at higher risk after seeing several with Alzheimer's. And their children would say, mom was struck by dad many years ago. Do you think that that was a contributing factor to our mother getting Alzheimer's disease? It prompted him to conduct a small study in 2006 finding women with dementia were indeed more likely to have been physically abused, but little has happened in the decades since. I do find it frustrating that this is an important problem and it's an important problem that requires additional evaluation and additional study. So Dr. Weaver, uh, familiar face in that story. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I hate the sound of my own voice. <laughs> Uh, tell us more about this. This is interesting. Um, repetitive head trauma is a risk for dementia and Alzheimer's disease and for CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, years ago, many years ago, this was called dementia pugilistica. A pugilist is a boxer. Um, they made pugilist is the fancy word for a boxer. And so dementia pugilistica was the dementia boxer. They were punch drunk. Uh, and it was appreciated that uh, that boxers, you know, especially um, uh, boxers who had been knocked out a fair number of times, had a high risk of of developing uh, dementia. Um, and if you looked at the boxers who developed dementia, they tended to be low in their weight category, uh, to fight more often, and to have been knocked out more often. Um, so if we now turn to domestic violence. The domestic violence is a much larger problem, I think, than is recognized. Um, depending on which study you see, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, the number that, that I um, <clears throat> looked at was probably in about 17% of relationships, there's some degree of physical assault against the woman. Um, that's pretty high, 17%. That's unacceptably high, of course. Um, 
And if you look in general, there's a weight disparity, just like in the boxers. I mean, in general, um, female weighs less. Uh, and I mean, if we look at, at a not, you know, unfortunately not a, a, an unusual story that there is a particular abusive relationship where once a month or once a week, um, you know, fueled by alcohol or whatever, uh, problems arise at home and, and you know, she is struck uh, and maybe uh, have concussions and, and whatnot. So this is the exact same thing as, as boxing. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, so what we did is we uh, looked at uh, a number of women presenting with Alzheimer's disease and matched it uh, with an age match group of women presenting with stroke. And there was a whole lot more domestic violence uh, in, in the Alzheimer's group. So, you know, your brain is precious. Um, yeah, I, I said before, you know, it's, it's what makes you, you, it is, um, uh, you know, that to hell with your fingerprint, uh, the, 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 the gyri of your brain are, are, are uniquely yours. Uh, the, those 85 billion neurons and the network that they make is why I'm me and you're you. Um, and, and um, it doesn't like being sloshed around. It just doesn't like it. Uh, and um, the, um, uh, you know, so uh, this is not merely a problem for football players or hockey players. Uh, this is a problem for anybody. Um, and, uh, and in fact, you know, if you look, um, uh, concussions in, say, uh, women's sports are probably more frequent than they are in male sports. Um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, um, concussions in uh, women's basketball are actually fairly common. And, um, you know, concussions from domestic violence is also fairly common. Um, and, uh, you know, we just can't have that because that's another risk factor for Alzheimer's. And aducanumab and all the problems with it, the diagnosis and all the problems that we have with it, let's face it, the best thing we have right now is not getting it. Um, and so I think that we should be all, you know, doing our utmost to avoid all the risk factors. And we started by talking about heart and heart health. Yes, that's important. But, you know, there's all these other uh, risk factors that are recognized and repetitive head trauma is one of them. And we have to look for repetitive head trauma wherever it is. And domestic violence is one of those quiet things that we don't talk about, but we should talk about it because it's a very real risk factor. I think that's so important because you're right. People don't talk about it. Many people probably are not talking about it with their, again, with their doctor. So nobody is identifying then a, that this is happening and B that it's a risk factor. And therefore that that person is at risk because of that experience that's happened. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, you know, it's well, bloody unnecessary. Yeah. And you're, and you're right. When there's not effective treatments, not getting it in the first place is really the most. It's the best treatment. The best treatment. <laughs> Just don't not. get it if you can't. Now, I mean, it's easy to say, and uh, you know, um, and and I don't want people of Alzheimer's to think, well, geez, if I'd done something differently in life, you know, no, no. But I'm just saying there are risk factors which contribute, and let's minimize those risk factors and make people aware of what they are, because I don't think that there is a lot of awareness of some of the ones that we've talked about tonight. Um, no. You know, COVID, dementia, heart. All of those to me are not things that people are generally widely aware of. Um, you know, the um, um, living in a polluted city is a risk factor, said he who's currently living in Toronto. <laughs> um, the um, uh, and, um, uh, yeah, you know, th that that's a significant risk factor. Uh, reduced hearing can be a risk factor. I mean, that's more one of the more uh, recently recognized ones. So if there's hearing impairment, get a hearing aid, improve your hearing, mm -hmm. optimize all those things that we can optimize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, thank you for bringing that research to the fore, because I do think that that's something that is not, not really well understood and important for us to, to talk about. That is the last of the formal headlines that we are putting up on the screen tonight. Uh, we are going to switch over to doing the Q&A portion, but first we are going to put another poll up. This one we are just wanting to know, not related to our discussion specifically, but what area of dementia research do you feel needs more attention? 
your options, causes and risk factors, prevention and treatment, caregiver support, quality of life, community programs, long-term care. Now, I believe you can, I might be wrong. I believe you can actually pick more than one. Because they all need it. They sure do. Those are all important ones. I'm sorry, but I haven't got the poll on my screen. I'm not sure why that would be. Depends which browser you're using. Probably. Well, it's okay. If the poll isn't, we're not using the poll for anything um, informing more of this discussion tonight. It was more for our interest in understanding what people see as priorities. <clears throat> All right, I think we've got the poll closed. So pretty well, even across the board, but not surprisingly prevention and treatment uh, coming out a little bit ahead at 83%. But yeah, really pretty even across there because there's a, um, I think I heard our national research director earlier, call it a desert, um, the sort of situation with research in dementia and, and in particular with treatments, but um, all of yeah. those do need the attention, absolutely. So thank you for that. I'm going to take my glasses off so that I can read up a little more closely at what some of the chat questions are. Um, so I'm just going to read these and then get you to respond to them as best you can. Oh, geez. Thanks. <laughs> and if you, and if you can't, um, well, you can, we can always get back to people if, the, if people have questions. Yeah. Uh, so Joyce has asked, could a person that has a fall and broke a pelvis and hip in previous year, 2014 have caused early onset dementia? Um, so <clears throat> The, um, I mean, does a, a broken hip contribute to dementia? Probably not, but a fall, a fall that is uh, big enough um, to break a hip uh, may have a degree of, um, of concussion associated with it. Uh, please remember that you don't have to be hit in the head to get a concussion. Um, I mean, if you are slammed hard enough anywhere in your body, your, your brain is floating in a bag of water and it sloshes around. Um, and uh, so a major fall can give you a concussion, which can lead to, to other issues. But to be, um, um, I think much more likely what we see, and I mean, we see things like this, not all the time, not, not infrequently in the clinical setting, is that the person may have had an underlying cognitive problem and mild memory problem, but was coping. Uh, and it was there, but it was just under the surface and hadn't been noticed. A and something like a, a major fall, which puts additional stress on them in terms of self-care and other issues, has, has, has brought it to the foreground and has unmasked uh, what was probably there already underneath the surface. And I think that that is more likely to be the explanation. But as I said, uh, a significant concussion in, in an older person can lead to cognitive issues and a fall big enough to break fracture your hip could uh, uh, lead to a concussion in, those, in that regard. Okay. Um, we're kind of going all over the place a little bit in topics here. So oh, Barbara, <laughs> Barbara has asked, are there as many people with Alzheimer's as there is with cancer? Is it poorly funded because cancer has better marketing? Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's tough to say with cancer because um, there, uh, there are so many types of cancer. Uh, you know, there's bowel cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, you can go through. Uh, and, and those buggers fundraise for all of them. Um, and um, you see what we just do globally, Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, the, uh, uh, so um, I, what are the issues? I think the issues are, first of all, um, that, um, uh, cancer is more, I mean, I'm being really blunt and cold here. People say cancer affects younger people and therefore, uh, we should be putting more effort into it. And I mean, I hear that all the time, bugs me to no end, but they go, well, you know, like a 20 year old can get cancer. Whereas 
you know, and, and therefore, should we be putting more money into a 20 year old versus an 80 year old in terms of dollars and cents? Um, and so, you know, I, I don't like that explanation, but I certainly hear it. Um, <clears throat> The, the other uh, issue uh, relates to the joke, you know, of the, of the little boy who lost the, the coin and he's looking under the street lamp and someone says, oh, where'd you lose? And he goes up the street and they go, well, why are you looking here? And he goes, this is where the light is. Um, and um, uh, when it comes to cancer, uh, they've got lots of approaches. They can do lots of things that work and success breeds success. A lot of drugs that work against cancer. And so if you're a researcher, you're going, hmm, you know, if you're brand new into research and you're making drugs, you go, can I go into cancer where I have a shot at coming up with something or should I go into Alzheimer's or my likely to failure is 98%. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, it just, uh, cancer has uh, traditionally got more money. Uh, and I think that, you know, the, the statement that I made that, you know, I would hope that everyone on this call is an advocate. And this is one of the points, this is the exact point we should be making that cancer has done quite well because it has had huge amounts of money pumped into it. And the same payoff will come if, in Alzheimer's if we have the same sort of, of uh, you know, widespread commitment, both in terms of uh, a number of researchers working on it, number of research dollars going into it. So uh, no, from my point of view, Alzheimer's is a much bigger socioeconomic problem than cancer. Uh, but cancer has traditionally enjoyed much better funding. All right, thank you for that. Another question, is Alzheimer's hereditary? Our family, this is a question from Joyce, I should say, is Alzheimer's hereditary? Our family has several members on both sides diagnosed with the disease. My husband has a shunt already, but also has a blocked artery in his neck. Will we see the disease advance more quickly? Has stents in his heart as well? Um, so you don't know, um, and uh, you can't jump to any conclusions. All you can do is, is watch and, and wait. Um, the, um, is it hereditary? Um, a very small percentage of it is. Uh, so probably about four, five, six percent uh, of Alzheimer's ultimately has a significant hereditary component. Most of it is what we call sporadic, uh, and um, I mean, it happens, bad things happen. Um, the, um, so, um, you know, no, it, it is not necessarily uh, her hereditary. Um, the other issue that I will mention is that I was also talking about, you know, is, is what we call Alzheimer's one disease or more than one disease. Uh, and at a fairly crude level right now, we do talk about young onset Alzheimer's disease and late onset Alzheimer's disease. Late onset being typically over 65, uh, but usually, you know, over 70, uh, but um, uh, young onset tends to be, you know, people in, in their 50s. And, you know, I even have some patients in their late 40s uh, with uh, young onset. And it is the young onset ones who are more likely to have uh, one of the uh, genetic um, uh, components to it. And certainly if you're looking for the young onset ones, uh, presenolin 1, presenolin 2, APP, these are the sorts of genes that, that uh, one gets identified. Okay, thank you. We had a few different questions um, related to genetics, uh, wanting to know how important the genetic link is. Some Barbara saying, I have a family member with amyloids. Is this the same? Is this something that is the same as the amyloids in Alzheimer's? Um, and so um, amyloid is a term for any protein that clumps up and gums up. Beta amyloid is the amyloid that is involved in Alzheimer's disease. But there is a disease called systemic amyloidosis um, where individuals get amyloid that could uh, clump up and affect their heart, their, their kidneys uh, and, and other organ systems. And be, if a person has systemic amyloidosis, meaning not brain, but elsewhere in the body, and they have systemic amyloidosis that may have, say, caused um, uh, kidney problems, renal problems, that does not imply in any way, shape, or form that they are at risk for cerebral amyloidosis, beta amyloid amyloidosis, or Alzheimer's disease. Ah, okay. Well, there we go. Christine has also asked a separate topic. Is it only possible to confirm an Alzheimer's diagnosis after death? 100%, yeah. Um, the... Uh, but I mean, let's face it, we're getting a whole lot better at it now. 
Uh, and um, um, <clears throat> so, you know, historically we talked about possible Alzheimer's and probable Alzheimer's and definitive Alzheimer's. Um, since we do not have the blood tests, we don't have all of those. Uh, the stock answer is, is that the only way to know 100% without any hint of, of failure is to do an autopsy and to demonstrate uh, the aggregation of, of amyloid and, and tau in the brain. But with current um, diagnoses of, of doing MRIs, and there's nothing characteristic but an MRI uh, about Alzheimer's. So I'm, I'm not saying you can diagnose uh, uh, Alzheimer's on an MRI, but um, shall we say you can diagnose the vascular problems and all the other problems. So if you do the full spectrum of things, you're way more than 90% certain in your call of Alzheimer's now. Hmm. Okay. Um, Reed has asked a question. This may be outside your bailiwick. Uh, I can make was, it up. But it's interesting, relating, I think, to our first, our first story on COVID. Was there an increase in dementia after the Spanish flu or after SARS or MERS? Uh, so after the Spanish flu of 1918, um, <clears throat> there was um, a, uh, a, a post-viral encephalitis that did occur, uh, and it was more associated with movement disorders. Uh, and so there was uh, definite um, uh, problems with Parkinsonism. Uh, so like a Parkinson's disease-like syndrome uh, has been implicated and related to the 1918 flu pandemic. Uh, and associated with that, uh, you know, there, there is some overlap between Parkinsonism and, and cognitive issues. So um, it, it's not a clear cut dementia, it's not a clear cut Alzheimer's, uh, but um, there, there was some uh, implications around a post encephalitic um, Parkinsonism that was associated with the 1918 flu pandemic. And uh, looking at other um, uh, things related uh, to coronavirus, um, the, uh, so MERS and SARS and, and, and issues like that, um, there, there, thankfully there wasn't a huge numbers of cases like, like we're dealing with, with COVID, uh, and, um, uh, did, uh, certain individuals have neurologic implications? Yes, because, uh, this is a virus that likes brain, uh, but to date there's no definitive evidence suggesting, uh, that, uh, dementia is a long-term consequence of those. Interesting. And there's another one that's sort of uh, similar, and I'm not familiar with this one, but can California encephalitis lead to frontal temporal dementia? I don't know. If you're uh, good question. And, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, uh, look at it this way. Um, <clears throat> anything that is a significant insult to your brain can set you up for long term cognitive problems. Uh, and any major encephalitis certainly can do that. A different set of um, health factors that somebody's asking if they can contribute. Giselle is wondering, her sister led a very healthy life, but suffered from osteoporosis, Paget's disease, and hyperthyroidism. Can these diseases have contributed to her getting dementia in her early 60s? Um, <clears throat> so uh, osteoporosis and Paget's disease are, are both primarily bony diseases. Uh, and uh, so to the best of my knowledge, no. Um, thyroid. Um, the, uh, anybody who has been uh, wonderfully hyperthyroid likes it. Um, the, um, um, uh, you know, if, if you're running a slightly high thyroid level, life's good. Um, uh, you don't need as much sleep. You can sit down and eat that extra large pizza and not put on any weight. Uh, and, um, um, so there are receptors in your brain for thyroid hormone. Um, and if you're running hyperthyroid, you have too much thyroid, you tend to think more quickly. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it, it's not a bad state to be in, I am told. If you're hypothyroid, you tend to be slowed down, more given to depression, more given to cognitive issues. And so um, the, 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 the level of thyroid hormone in you can affect cognition. Whether or not it's a risk factor for Alzheimer's, I don't know. I would suspect not, but, was, but fluctuations in thyroid hormone certainly can affect cognition and memory. You had mentioned um, pollution as being a risk factor for dementia. Lisa has asked, do farm chemicals affect a person for dementia? Affect a person? 
I'm thinking um, she means probably make you more likely. Is it a risk factor for dementia? Yeah, certainly. Um, there is an interesting uh, range of studies on um, the wide range of chemicals that are used in the agricultural uh, industry and their relationship to Parkinson's disease. Um, and so uh, there certainly is, you know, some uh, concern that um, exposure to certain of the agents that are used may predispose to, to Parkinsonism uh, and to some chronic neurologic problems. Um, the, uh, so uh, in terms of this being an explicit risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, uh, not that I'm aware, but once again, um, your brain you know, is special and uh, bathing it in chemicals that you shouldn't be. Uh, I'm willing to believe that anything can set you up for anything. Um, you know, if, if you have sufficient exposure. All right. I think that I am going to do one more question and then wrap up our Q and A because we're, I know there are still a number of questions in here, but we uh, getting close to our, our time. There's been a lot uh, of great questions. I mean, I've been reading them and sometimes I just want to go, yes, no, maybe, you know. In well, I mean, go ahead and do that. Like, you <laughs> certainly can do up, that. But, uh, a lot of them are related they, to um, causes, right? And causes yeah, and risk factor, yeah. kind of stroke. And, and, and stuff, who knows? I mean, oh, I, I, sorry, I, I will. I saw one interesting question. Yeah, go for um, it. About anesthesia. anesthesia. Uh, right. Someone posed a question, uh, is, is anesthesia a potential risk factor? Okay. Um, that is a very interesting area. Uh, and um, um, the, uh, so exposure to general anesthetics has been demonstrated in many animal, in animal models and experimental things to promote the clumping of amyloid and tau. Um, hmm. Yeah. And so there is a, a rich anecdotal literature out there of individuals who say may have had MCI, mild cognitive impairment, who had a general anesthetic. And afterwards, the, the dementia took off. Um, the, um, uh, so, um, you know, there, there is a, a growing literature uh, that, um, uh, you know, exposure to general anesthesia, in, in susceptible individuals um, uh, may, may indeed uh, be a risk factor. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm always um, saying, you know, if I need an operation, uh, can you do it under local? Uh, <laughs> yeah, if, if at all possible, I want to, mm. I want to avoid general anesthesia. Interesting. Okay, I know again. the same would not be the same for a spinal. That's what I'm saying, general, general anesthetic. So uh, having a spinal, having a regional anesthesia, you know, if you are older, avoid general anesthetics. Go for uh, regional anesthetic if you can. Huh. And again, that's of course, the anesthetists probably... are going to hate me for saying that because they're a whole lot harder to do, and they're going to go bloody neurologist. Uh, but um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, but you know, I don't care. Uh, the uh, you know, short of opening my head or my chest, I, I would want to prefer. I would personally want to avoid general anesthesia. Okay, that's good for that's good for us to know because not something that everybody might be considering when they're presented with those options or even initiating a conversation with their doctor to see if there's different options sometimes, I would imagine. All right. We will just come back here tomorrow night and answer the rest of the questions, right? <laughs> everybody free tomorrow and we'll just come back. No. <laughs> they were good I, questions. They were excellent questions. My my compliments to your viewership. Yeah. <laughs> those were uh, those what that was that was first rate yeah some really great questions and yeah. you know i think that the the reason that we are doing this event tonight is because we know that um being up to speed on the latest in dementia research is so important that having people be informed in those conversations that they're having with healthcare providers that having an informed public about reputable sources of information when we, you know, when we talk about aducanumab and some of these other pieces, um, knowing where to get good information, sharing good information, and promoting good information. I want to thank and commend everybody who has joined us tonight for obviously making that a priority uh, because that's how you're choosing to spend your evening tonight. 
Um, Dr. Weaver, I want to thank you. I think that probably everybody would agree that this has been just fascinating to hear um, the sorts of insights that you can give us. Because again, we we read these stories, they come across our, you know, our, well, I guess most of us on the internet, most of us on the computer. Um, but we don't always have the ability to assess on our own or even spend the time to think about uh, about the information in the way we really might like to. And so we really appreciate you taking the time here to talk to everybody who's joined us. I know you can't see all their faces, but certainly we can see those questions coming in. Um, and so we know they appreciate that. Um, I wanna thank Courtney for being here um, to introduce you and for being one of that group of upcoming researchers that the Alzheimer's Society of Manitoba funds. I think that a lot of people who are here tonight probably support. She's one of the people who's going to be carrying that torch forward and ensuring that that research community remains vibrant. So Courtney, I wanna thank you as well. I want to say a last thank you to our event sponsor, Brightwater Winnipeg. With their help, again, we were able to do this free of charge for participants. So thank you to Brightwater Winnipeg. And a thank you to everybody for being here tonight. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. <laughs>